Okay, tonight I've advertised a fairly narrow question, but I mean to illustrate a principle which is both fundamental and very general. I think that if I introduce it with, in the context of a small manageable problem, fairly intuitive, that will introduce, introduce the idea, and then we'll show the, some of the farther reaches of the principle. Prayer is centered on petition. The reason for prayer is petition. The weekdays, the majority of the words are devoted to petition. We ask God to give us things or do things for us. Now, the reason you ask for anything from anybody is because you believe that the asking could affect the outcome. Could affect. Needs at least to be possible. That means to say, it's at least possible that if you ask, you'll get it, and if you don't ask, you won't get it. If somehow, thank you very much, the outcome were guaranteed, irrespective of your making the petition, then making the petition would be pointless, would be absurd. And never does the Torah require us to do something that's absurd. Never. You can quote me. Now the question is, why should we believe that making a petition of God could affect the outcome? The situation is such that if we ask, we'll get it. If we don't ask, we won't get it. And one naive way of putting this question is, well, if I'm asking, it sounds like I'm trying to change God's mind. He apparently has decided that he's not going to give it to me. I ask so that he'll change his mind and give it to me. That's why. If I don't ask, I won't get it, because he's made up his mind that I shouldn't get it. And it may very well be that, if I ask, he'll change his mind and give it to me. <clears throat> that would mean the act of petition is an attempt to change God's mind. <sighs> that sounds like a little bit too audacious. It sounds a little bit uh, too um, self-aggrandizing. I'm going to do something to change God's mind. On the other hand, we want to understand how could it be that the outcome could depend upon my petition. Now, there's a simple answer to this question. The reason that you're worried about changing God's mind is because you picture God's mind like this. He's got everything figured out, everything determined, down to the last detail, the whole of future history, every event that will happen is already under control, and he's managing the whole. In particular, God's will dictates every event that will take place. So if that's true, then in particular, let's say I'm asking for a raise in salary. I wouldn't do that because it's hopeless here. But <laughs> you could, other people could do it. As for a raise in salary, I have to imagine that God has already decided that my salary should stay the same. And now I'm asking for a raise, which means I'm asking to change his mind. The truth is that the premise, the assumption, which now has generated this problem, is incorrect. The answer to the problem is very simple. In certain circumstances, God's will can be the following. His will is, if he doesn't ask, I won't give it to him. And if he does ask, I will give it to him. His will is inherently conditional. It isn't absolute and unconditional. It's conditional upon what the person does. In that case, when I make my request, I'm not trying to change God's mind. I'm trying to trigger one of the two things that God is committed to. God is committed to, if A, hap if a happens, then A star will be the result. He's committed also simultaneously if B happens, then B star will be the result. 
either A or B is going to happen. So if I do A, I'm triggering his already in place will that if A happens, A starts to be the result. And if I do B, then I'm triggering his already in place will that if B happens, B starts to be the result. God's mind doesn't change because his mind is inherently conditional. Now, is this a reasonable idea? I just, did I just make this up? That God could have a conditional mind and thereby I'm not trying to change his mind. Maybe that's just my naivete. Maybe Jewish theology is more complete, more exact, more all-encompassing than that. And God's mind is made up from the beginning about everything that's going to happen. That's certainly not true. There's at least one area in which everyone knows, a cardinal area in which God's mind is, is, is defined as conditional from the very outset. And you all know what it is. It's reward and punishment. I get a reward if I do a mitzvah. I get punished if I violate a mitzvah. It isn't as if God has a decision. He's going to get X no matter what, no matter what he does. On the contrary, reward is for when you do a mitzvah and punishment is when you don't do a mitzvah. So sometimes God's mind is, is conditional. There's no question about that. That can't be escaped. I know that God's mind is conditional, at least on some occasions. It's perfectly appropriate to say that when you're praying, you're taking advantage of the conditionality of God's mind. That's why the outcome does depend upon your making the petition. Sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Remember, to make a petition, I have to believe that in this particular case, it's possible. It's possible that the outcome depends upon my, uh, uh, my action. I don't have to believe it will be. You don't always, you don't wait for certainty that you'll succeed before you act. You want a possibility or a reasonable probability, and then you act knowing that it might indeed be impossible, but you can't know beforehand it's impossible. That would make it absurd. Yeah? When you say it's conditional, <coughs> does God know which, which um, path you'll take? Yes. So, so uh, how does it help say it's true that it's, it's sort of unconditional, but then it's just a free will and core knowledge paradox. So it's not really a... Oh no, because again, how will you explain how will you explain what I'm doing? I have to believe that my prayer will make a difference in the outcome. That's certainly true. Even though he knows whether I'm going to pray, whether I'm not going to pray, but it's still true from my point of view that if I don't pray, I won't get. And if I do pray, I will get. Those two conditions are correct, and they are both his conditional will for what should happen and its consequences. The impartial, more elaborate answer to your question, these are not simply arbitrary, concrete decisions of God's part. They follow from much more general principles of justice and mercy and the necessities of the world and this world versus the next world. There are lots and lots of factors that are, that are involved. I'm just, I'm just describing what the practical outcome is in my case of getting a raise in salary. But it's still true that, it, it may be true, and that's what I'm counting on when I ask, that... If I don't ask, my salary will stay the same. If I do ask, my salary will go up. Both of those are true. In fact, only one will happen. But from my point of view, since I don't know what's going to happen, it's my choice that's going to determine which one happens. So then I still have to make the decision. God knows that I'm going to make the choice, but that has nothing to do with my, cho my choosing procedure. I've, I've heard some people were, were, I don't know if it's true or not, they were saying that God sort of knows what's going on in people, knows all the underlying reasons behind it, not quite know the outcome of what exactly you do. So that's, this, this uh, idea that God only knows underlying reasons or he may know the uh, possible consequences but not the actual event is to save against another problem. And that problem is how can God know the future and our wills be free? That's an interesting problem. I've spoken about it many times. There are two ways of dealing with the problem in Jewish sources, which are, each of which is perfectly satisfactory. And that being the case, um, problem for which we have two methods of dealing with, we don't lose much sleep over. Um, uh, but I'm not dealing with that tonight. That's not my question tonight. I'm even dealing with a different question tonight. Yeah. Rob, is it up to our uh, power to pray for something to remain? Or pray for something that what? To remain. Oh, absolutely. Uh, pray for something th that should remain. You know, I, I have been asked, Rabbi, why should I pray for healing, I'm not sick? See, if you look in the art school sitter, they have something very nice there. On that, uh, 
the title of that, brotha, of that blessing is Health and Healing. Aha! Healing is what I want to happen to change my condition when I'm sick. Health is what I'm asking for as a continuous condition. And when the student says, but, but Rabbi, I am healthy, I say, I, su I suggest you change your vocabulary. Say, I have been healthy. There's no guarantee from one second to the next. Read the medical literature. So um, to pray that I should remain healthy is absolutely appropriate. No question about it. Yeah. Since we don't know if we're going to change his mind or not, so to speak, how do we know when to just stop praying for how do we know when to stop praying? It's a very, very good question. Um, I don't think there's any general rule. I think it will depend upon circumstances, in particular what you're praying for and how the conditions develop. I think it will also depend upon what effect the prayer has on you. If you're the kind of person who, asking and asking and not getting what you want, is going to depress you and uh, make you dispirited and lose energy and so on and so on, that also could, could play a role. I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. It's a complicated question. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't pray for things that are like almost guaranteed. I think you said right before or something that just the outcome is something. Right before what? Sorry. I think you said uh, was it we yeah. wouldn't pray for things in which the outcome or something is already guaranteed. I think you mentioned that we wouldn't do anything for no reason. Or things would seem pointless. Um, or something. Along yeah. Like in other words, I, uh, what I said was if I believed that my prayer couldn't make any difference to the outcome, then it would be absurd. To Should I pray like that the sun continues to rise tomorrow? I mean, would that be something that I... Abs God I mean, that we'd say that Rokah HaRat Salamai. We praise God for, for spreading out the earth on the, on the, on the waters. Um, I think it's, in, it's, it, it's um, assumed in many of our prayers that the natural circumstances are going to, uh, are going to continue. And you don't praise... You wouldn't praise God if you weren't involved in the things that happen every day, all the time. Should we continue to pray? Well, should we be asking, though, that those natural circumstances continue? Um, I don't see in the petitions anywhere that we ask, that we ask for something like that. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. The, where would you draw the line? That was my next point, too. Right, right. Um, all the petitions that we have are cases where I'm asking for X, and it's quite clear and obvious and common that often X doesn't come. So, and even if you have it, then it's, it doesn't have to continue with you. So... Um, I have no data on which to say it goes up to here or you would ever ask for, for something, uh, something other than that. I don't know of any petitions that, that, um, that deal with things which we take for granted as the course of nature. But uh, I mean, it just may just be my ignorance. I, I, I don't know any principle where that would forbid that. OK, let's try another example. Oh, you want to ask a question? Um, it's, it's such a big question. How does Judge's uh, uh, Sukkim and Jewish uh, uh, Catholic questions uh, that were killed in uh, Nazi Germany? Well, okay. Today I'm talking about yeah. the <laughs> of God's will. That's really not the subject for for, for this uh, for this discussion. In fact, well, I'll leave it behind. That, it's not the subject that I'm dealing with tonight. I'm sorry. Yeah. My, my only reason is there were a lot of. Uh, really good Jews that uh, they were praying uh, every day, and uh, I'm sure there, there were a lot of studies with that. Yes, but that doesn't bear on what I said. All I said was, you have to believe that your prayer could change the outcome. Not that it will change the outcome, that it could change the outcome. Right? And they had every reason to believe that it could change the outcome. And in certain individual cases, it surely did change the outcome number of people went through and testified that it was miraculous that they went through. There was no way they could have gone through without miracles. So it isn't as if prayer was, it was inactive. And beyond that, that's not, it goes beyond my subject for tonight. Let's take another example of the, of the principle that I'm talking about. Um, 
here's poor Ruven Schwartz. Now, Ruven Schwartz is a nice guy, and he keeps kosher and Shabbos, is sort of. But when McDonald's has a two-for-one bacon cheeseburger sale, you know, he, that's it. He goes to pieces, and he... And he uh, <clears throat> two-for-one! I'll keep kosher next week. You know, but this week, it's just too hard. And he goes and Now, I want to know, I want to ask this question. What does God want from Ruven Schwartz? It seems that, the way I've described him, you might be stuck with two contradictory answers. On the one hand, no one is strong enough to fight with God. No one is strong enough to make something happen if God doesn't want it to happen. Now, Ruben Schwartz eats the bacon cheeseburger. He actually does that. So, it seems, it must be, that God wants him to eat it. Because God didn't want him to eat it, he wouldn't be able to eat it. On the other hand, God did tell us, don't eat bacon cheeseburgers. He did. So it does sound like he doesn't want us to eat bacon cheeseburgers. So, what shall we say here? What does God want? If you say that he wants us not to eat, it's very peculiar that we are able to eat. If you say that he wants us to eat, then how is it that he commands us not to eat? Sounds like there's no consistent answer. Now, as I will show you, we are sinning against the same principle. There's no consistent answer if you think the answer has to be God wants X always under all conditions, no matter what, you know, whether the sky stands or the sky falls, God wants X and only X always. Or Y always and only. If those are the only answers you will accept, then you're going to be in trouble. But the answer is what God wants is conditional. It's conditional on circumstances. So, let's put it this way. What God really wants is that Reuben Schwartz should keep kosher voluntarily. He wants him to choose to keep kosher. And means he wants him to choose freely to keep kosher. Which means he wants him to choose to keep kosher without outside causation, without outside manipulation, without outside forcing. Which means what God wants is for Reuben Schwartz to keep kosher without God making him keep kosher. That's what he wants. So, if that's what God wants, he can't make it happen. Because what he wants is for it to happen without his making it happen. That's what he wants. He wants it to happen without his making it happen. So now, what does God want to happen? Well, God wants that if Ruben Schwartz chooses to be brave and focused and self-sacrificing, that he overcomes the temptation and doesn't eat the bacon cheeseburgers, then he wants us to be able not to eat the bacon cheeseburgers. But he also wants that if Reuven Schwartz chooses to eat the bacon cheeseburgers, he wants him to be able to eat the bacon cheeseburgers. Because he wants what, Abraham, what, what Reuven Schwartz does to be a result of his free will. Maimonides writes about this in the eighth chapter of the Shemona Prokim and in the Mishnah Torah and other places. Maimonides is quite consistent about this. And he makes the following analogy. A person throws a rock into the air and it falls down. Is it God's will that the rock fall down? Absolutely. It's God's will that when you throw a rock into the air, it should fall down. It's not God's will that the rock should fall. Suppose the rock's on the ground. Is it still his will the rock should fall? You mean God will pick it up and drop it so that it should fall? No. God has no interest in the rock transver tra uh, tra uh, uh, transversing the distance from the above to below. He has an interest, he has will that what we would call gravity should operate, which means if you throw it up, then it will come down. So God's will, when that rock comes down, we say it's God's will that it comes down, it was a conditional will. If it's elevated, then it should come down. If it isn't elevated, it shouldn't come down. <coughs> Even when the rock goes up, it's a conditional will. And Maimonides makes that explicitly similar to the idea of, of free will. Just as God wants 
what we would call the force of gravity, operate on the, on the rock, so that if it's raised, it should fall. So God wants man's actions to be the result of his free will, so that if he chooses, what he chooses will happen. And if he doesn't choose, something else will happen. So you say, like my mind is example, you're sitting in a chair. Is it God's will that you should be sitting in that chair? The answer is, given that you've decided to sit down and haven't decided that you should get up. Yes, it's his will that you should be sitting in that chair because when you sit down in a chair and you don't flex your muscles, you remain sitting in the chair because that's the way God wants the world to run. But if you had changed your mind, decided not to come to the lecture, you would not have been spiritually transported here to suffer under my, <laughs> under my words for an hour. That wouldn't have happened. It's not that he has a will that you should be here. He has a will that if you choose to be here, then you will be here. If you choose something else, for many, many times. Sometimes he doesn't allow will op- uh, free will to operate, but the vast, vast majority of the time he does. So again, the solution to the problem is don't treat God's will as absolute and unconditional. Understand that when he wills something to happen, he wills it to happen because of the conditions that were set up. And if the conditions had been different, in this, in this particular case, free choice, what he had chosen to do, poor Ruvain Schwartz. If he, if, if he had chosen to stay home and, and keep kosher, he would have stayed up kosher. If he had chosen to, to, uh, to go to the, to the restaurant, then he would have eaten the bacon cheeseburgers. So if you ask, what does God want? I'll put it like in precise, in precise direct terms. When, you, when someone asks, what does God want? The answer is, it depends. God wants that. If he chooses to keep kosher, he will keep kosher. And God wants that if he chooses to eat his bacon cheeseburger, he will eat the bacon cheeseburger. So that's the way in which his action will flow from his own decision. Now if you ask, but which would God prefer that he choose? The answer is, of course, God would prefer that he choose to keep kosher. That's what the command says. The command says, what you do will be the result of your free choice. But I prefer, I command you, to choose to keep kosher. But I'm commanding you to freely choose that you keep kosher. When I command you to freely choose, I'm acknowledging that you have the power to resist. That was the failure in the original way of putting the, uh, the question. We said, if he, eats a free, if, if he eats a cheeseburger and God uh, wants him not to eat a cheeseburger, how is he strong enough to fight against God? The answer is, it isn't true that God wants him not to eat the cheeseburger. God wants him to freely not eat the cheeseburger. And against that, of course, given that he has free will, he does have the power to resist what God wants. Yes, he does. Because that's what God wants. Okay, are we together? Yeah. So that uh, uh, unconditional uh, expression of his free will, you said perhaps uh, you could interpret it as tell them, Elohim, like is that the... It's very tricky. He's asking whether that... I didn't say free will was no, 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 unconditional, no, no. but the power of free will. You know, whether the power of free will is the, is the tzel and elokim. I don't think that's the right way to put it, but you're on the right track. Uh, it's through the exercise of free will that we develop the tzel and elokim. It's not the power of choice that makes us, Rambam writes about this in, in great length, it's not the power of choice that makes us holy, it's what we choose, our whole, our, our, our choose to make ourselves into, what we choose to do. Indeed, a person can use his power of choice to make himself defiled and evil. His, free, his choice is just as free and remains just as free, but he makes himself defiled and evil. And that's not a, 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 a tell him that's not, uh, So it's, it's not just a power of choice. It's uh, what your choice brings you to do and become. Yeah. So can you like, pray then for let's say, God to influence your will in a certain way in order to better, let's say, keep kosher. It's saying, you know, can you, you know, not make me keep, you know, obviously that, but not, not force me, but in a sense, like, you know, uh, influence my will in a way where I could follow what you want me to do. So can you pray to God that he should influence your, your will? And you've used the key word now. This is very important, the word influence. Influence is the kosher word. Force is the, is the trait word. Yeah. Influence is because it doesn't carry the implication that you're, You've been caused without, without uh, any recourse on your part to do it. Yes, you certainly can ask God to, to influence your will because your asking him is your effort to make your will better. When you ask someone for help, the asking is how you generate the help. 
and you get and you get uh, credit for 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 asking. Um, and that wouldn't contradict one of the conditions you talked about. No, preserving our, our wealth. That's right. Uh, I, I, okay, it's complicated because there are conditions under which, if you use your free will to destroy your free will, that's good. It can be good. It'd be the highest. Of the right. We've talked about that. No, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Now, look, these are very simple applications for the principle, the granddaddy of the principle, which is discussed uh, widely, and I will take you through it. There's an incident in the life of Joseph from which this is taken. There's, um, <clears throat> I should say, as an introductory footnote, that there's a lot of talk as if what I'm going to tell you now is controversial, and there are different sides to the question, and so, and so forth and so on. But that turns out not to be true. Both Rav Avram Gerowitz and Rav Yaakov Hill have written essays on the subject to indicate that what I'm going to tell you now is the universal opinion of all Jewish sources. So if you've heard differently, I recommend that you read those, those uh, essays. <coughs> the brothers see Joseph coming, and they say, that's it. We've had it with Joseph. His life is over. We're going to kill him. Now, if you read the text carefully, Reuben says to them, let's not kill him. And then he speaks again, a separate speech, and he says, let's throw him in the pit. You have to understand. And he, and he calls this in later, where he says, I told you not to touch him. The, he first he said, let's not kill him. And their response is, you've got to be joking. We've convened the court. We've discussed his crimes. We know that he's, he deserves to be killed, and we're going to kill him. So Ruby says, okay, that's not going to work. Let's try something else. Throw him in the pit. Let your hand not be on him. Don't shed blood. Throw him in the pit. Why did they agree? They just said, we're going to kill him. When Ruben said not to kill him, he, uh, they said, no, of course we're going to kill him. Now he says, throw him in the pit, and they agree. So Chazal explained, because the pit had in it poisonous creatures, snakes and scorpions, that will kill him. All Ruben said was, don't let your hand shed blood. But he's admitting that, uh, that, um, that he's going to die there. And indeed, um, um, Yehuda, who later suggests that they should sell him, says to the brothers, why should we kill him? Let's sell him. So it's clear that they're planning, they were planning on killing him. So it's a question of how. Okay. So now, since we know from Chazal that the, the, the pit had in it snakes and scorpions, the question arises, this is in the Orachim, but it's also in the Zohar, and it's also in the, the um, also a bunch of other sources. What did Ruben think he was accomplishing? The text testifies he was doing this to bring him back to his father. So the brother's calculation is going to die either way. Reuben has this uh, uh, idea in his mind that we shouldn't do it directly, so we'll do it indirectly. So what? He's going to end up dead. The brothers are not foolish. It's not obvious they're making a mistake. Then what did Reuben think that he was accomplishing? The Orachim says like this. I'm adding a little bit just to give structure, but it's his idea from the other sources as well. Let's imagine how much merit Joseph has, how big a tzaddik he is. It could be that Joseph is such a big tzaddik that God wouldn't allow him to die. If the brothers try to strike him, the knives will turn to butter, or their hands become paralyzed, like the king who tried to offer a sacrifice to the, to the idol, his hand became paralyzed. It's not beyond God to stop it. And if you throw him in the pit, God will restrain the snakes and scorpions, he'll live either way. If that's true, if he has so much merit that God will save him either way, then Reuven is doing nothing. Mm. It's unnecessary. doesn't make any difference what they do. He's going to live anyhow. If, on the other hand, Joseph at the other end of the spectrum, he has so little merit that he'll die either way, the brothers strike him, he'll die. He'll throw him in the pit with snakes and scorpions, he'll die. Then again, Reuven's doing nothing. His action accomplishes nothing. But it's possible that Joseph's merit is in between the two. And here comes the key idea. It might very well be that Joseph's merit is such that in the pit, God will restrain the snakes and scorpions, but if the brothers attack him, they will succeed in killing him. 
If his merit is in that in-between range, then your ruin is saving his life. So Reuben is doing this on the possibility that he may be in the middle range and he's saving his life. He doesn't know for sure that it's so, but it's worth a try because he doesn't know where Joseph's merit is. So again, we're taking a, 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 seriously the possibility that if the brothers strike him, he'll die, and in the pit he will live. So here comes again, for the third time now, the phony question, what does God want? Does God want Joseph to live? Or does God want Joseph to die? Make up your mind. If you tell me that in the pit he will live, it means God wants Joseph to live. If God wants Joseph to live, then the brothers aren't strong enough to fight against God. God wants him alive, he'll be alive, whether his brothers strike him or not. If on the other hand you tell me that the brothers will kill him, so then it means God wants Joseph dead. If God wants Joseph dead, he'll die in the pit also. How can Ruvain's action make any difference? And you hear this. You hear this at, at funerals, at, at uh, eulogies. He died because his time was up. He died because God felt he finished his life. Nothing left to do. It accomplished all he needed to accomplish. Those words imply that no matter how he died, if that hadn't have happened, something else would have happened because his life was finished. He'd done everything he needed to do. He actually drove the car into a ditch and it turned over and he died. But let's suppose that he decided not to go driving. Then, then he'd been struck by lightning. His life was over at that moment. Over! So then he'd be killed either way. What we're saying is that's not true. We're saying that if the brothers strike him, he'll die. This has a big bearing on terrorism, doesn't it? Someone dies of a terrorist attack. If, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the brothers strike him, he'll die. And in the pit, he won't die. So what does God want? Now, by this time, it should be reeling off your, off your brain like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a mantra. It depends upon the conditions. If Joseph comes up against the free-willed action of the brothers, God has a very strong commitment to free will. He wants free will to operate. It's one of his highest priorities in running the world. And then for Joseph to be so meritorious that God will frustrate their free will would require a very great degree of merit on Joseph's part. Might be he doesn't have that much, that much merit. On the other hand, for God to restrain snakes and scorpions, the functioning of nature is a much lower priority on God's uh, ladder of priorities. So it could be that although Joseph doesn't have enough merit to frustrate free will, he does have enough merit to... Uh, justify saving his life in the pit. So when you ask, what does God want? You have to answer, well, it depends. If Joseph comes up against the free will of the brothers, God wants Joseph dead. If he's in the pit, God wants Joseph alive. What God wants depends upon the conditions that he's facing. No contradiction there. Only if you thought that God's desire, rotsom, will, which must be unconditional, absolute, universal, only if you thought that God must have those kinds of, of, of wills, would you have a problem here? See, in other words, again, someone says, you can't kill somebody unless God has decreed that he should die. No. Or let me put it, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say no. Let me say it better. Uh, that's true, but maybe God decreed that he should die because he came up against this kind of resistance. And had he come up against another type of resistance, he wouldn't have decreed that he died. Everything happens because of a decree. The question is, why did the decree happen? And the decree may be dependent upon the circumstances under which it takes, one which it takes place. This is a place where, where it comes up. Now, that means that the eulogy that I quoted a moment ago isn't always correct. Imagine giving a eulogy for, for Joseph and somebody saying, well... His life was over. You know, obviously he completed everything God wanted of him. Not so, because had they thrown him in the pit, God would have done a miracle to keep him alive. And even so, the brothers could kill him. That's the extent to which God's um, commitment to free will can uh, determine how the outcome will take place. Let me add one more thought, and then I'll, then I'll take questions. Now, I heard from Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, from whom I learned a number of very important things. Uh, I think I heard this on a tape. 
Um, maybe he told in person, I don't remember now anymore. He said, one way of understanding this in, de- in a little bit more detail may make it a sound or feel a little bit more reasonable than, than you might feel about it. Um, let's imagine a person was alive. God's keeping him alive. Why is God keeping him alive? Well, for a very tiny, select minority of Jews, the reason he's keeping him alive is because by the strictest standards of justice, with no mercy whatsoever, he has earned the right to be alive. Not a right against God, but under, under God, by God's standards, he has earned the, the right to be alive in the sense that he fulfilled God's conditions to the T of being alive. That might be. For the vast majority, we haven't earned it. The vast majority of our performances do not, de- de- do not determine that it should be so. We stay alive because of a combination of justice and mercy. Now, the way to put Joseph's condition, if he's in the middle realm, is this. He hasn't got enough merit to earn life through strict justice, then the brothers will be able to kill him. The only thing that will stop free will is someone who's earned the right to be alive through strict justice. Free will isn't strong enough to overcome a judge, a, a decree which is based on strict justice. But if Joseph is staying alive because of mercy, there, God says, free will is more important than the things I would do with mercy. So if his life depends upon God's mercy, then the brothers will be successful in, 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 in killing him. Uh, although in the pit, he may, mercy may de- decree that he's worthy of saving from the, from the forces of nature in the pit. So there's no inconsistency in the description of Joseph's condition, no inconsistency in describing the way, the way God's will works. And now we have, here's the case where people can hurt other people in ways that they wouldn't have gotten hurt if they hadn't come across the free will of those people. Yeah? So you're saying that the, listen, that you're allowed to use medicine on this child and stuff like that, but if somebody, if they imagine, and it makes one ill because you decree that they should change it, they should be careful that the thing should be the same. Is this a source for you in charity or, or, using, or, you, or using medical knowledge? I think over there, the situation is a little different. There is a mistake over there, and there is a correction to the mistake. I'll just mention it briefly since you asked it. But, um, the mistake over there is to say, this is the opposite of what I said about, about um, health. Uh, it says, this guy's asking for charity. So the fool says, why is, he, why is he poor? You believe in God, don't you? You believe in God's providence? Yes. So he's poor because God made him poor, right? Who am I to interfere with God's providence? <laughs> he made him poor, you know? I'm not going to change God's world. I'm not going to upset God's plans, you know? <laughs> he's in charge. If he wants to make a bitch, he can make a bitch also. Right? Who am I to contradict what God's done? Same thing with a person who's sick. I'm a doctor. Should I heal someone who's sick? He's only sick because God made him sick. So God wants him sick. So if God wants him sick, who am I to interfere? Now, half the problem you already know. We changed the vocabulary 16 minutes ago. We should say God has made him sick. God has made him poor. Not that he makes him poor, pleasant tense, but he has in the past. But the deep answer to the question is, from the fact that God has done X, that tells you nothing about how the future should go. Nothing. Why do you presume that God is so to speak so blindly conservative that he doesn't change his mind or doesn't change circumstances or doesn't want them to change? We never make arguments like that. Let's see, if God did this, did Coolidge, God wants that. So if God wants that, then I'm going to do this. We never make arguments like that. The reason is because God gave us a rule book. You want to know what to do? Look it up in the rule book. And sometimes the answer will be yes, sometimes the answer will be no. As a mitzvah of charity, so obviously God wants us to change the financial condition of poor people. Indeed, the mitzvah of charity is to give him as much money, as enough money so he won't be poor. That's where the real root mitzvah of charity. I say thing with someone's ill, although it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, the bottom line in Ipsak today is 
people should go to doctors, and doctors have a responsibility to heal the poor. And the idea that it's the sick, and the idea that he was sick and God made him sick, and therefore we shouldn't interfere, is a non-starter. It all depends upon the rule book. We don't try to read God's mind from his actions and say, if he did this and this, he sh-. because how does the argument go? If he did this and this, he surely wants that, and I'm going to do what he wants. Who told you what he surely wants? He has to tell you what he wants. And he tells you that by giving us the rules. So this is not, it's, it's a non-starter. Yeah. Do you, do you have cases where God says, this is going to be a thing that's going to happen? Like you mentioned with people with death. Like, uh, very, very rarely, you know, we don't see it as a, like, you know, this, this person would have died in any number of ways at this specific time. It doesn't matter what they were doing. Do you have cases where God wills that, wills the conclusion and not just the actual uh, conditions themselves? Sure, you do that, for example, when there are punishments. When God has decreed there should be a punishment for a certain action. And sometimes the punishment is necessary even if the person does tshuva. Can't, can't, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Rome doesn't say it that way. Uh, I just don't, don't call it punishment. That certain suffering should have to take place. But this is the famous rebellion of Korach. Right? Korach disputes Moses' authority in a certain way. And uh, he challenges a certain decision that Moses made on the grounds that Moses made it without God's authority. And Moses says, if these people die in their beds, like everybody else, then God did not send me to make this decision. But if the earth opens up its mouth and swallows them up alive, then God has, uh, uh, I, I, was, I was faithful, and I made the decision because God wanted to make the decision. And that's exactly what happens on the spot. So there, the outcome was decreed. Because of, the th- because of what they had done and what was necessary. Um, indeed, it, although the whole group was swallowed up, one group didn't die. The children of Korach didn't die. They were there, but, they, but they were swallowed up. It couldn't, it couldn't be avoided. Anyway, so, so we are now in, the, in, the, in this condition where we have to understand that God's will is conditional and that affects our, our actions and it affects the outcome of what we do in, uh, in various ways because by our actions we fulfill the antecedent, uh, what's called the hypothesis, or antecedent of, each, of, the, of this conditional, so that this one gets triggered, and we do it differently, we fulfill the antecedent of a different conditional, and it gets triggered in a different way, and we are definitely not trying to change God's mind. Okay? Um, the key thing to know, of course, is what are the conditions? What, what are the conditions that determine the outcome? That's one of the things that the Torah tells us. Um, the rules are not just do X and do Y. The rules often give explanations as to why we should do what we do. It also gives us a hierarchy of what should be done. So that there are conflicts. We, we, um, we resolve the conflicts by the rules that are given, which means that at least sometimes... God says, here's a mitzvah, do X. Here's a mitzvah, do Y. Now I'm in a situation where I can't do both. So then, at least sometimes, when the Torah says to do X, the way it's interpreted is, well, I told you to do Y. I know, I know, that's what it says, but you have to understand that what I meant was do Y unless X gets in the way. And then, and then of course, you have to do X and not Y. It was to say that the... The mitzvah telling you to do Y is really conditional on not having X as a competitor. But if there is a competitor, then, you know. So, for example, keeping Shabbos. I'm talking hutra rather than tchuya. That's for the specialists. Um, it, 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 and that's, of course, driving to the hospital on Shabbos. So there is a mitzvah to protect your life. There is a mitzvah of Shabbos. Very often they conflict. Very often. So you have to know what to do. And the answer is... You drive to the hospital on Shabbos. And then what you say is, Shabbos was commanded unless danger to your life gets in the way. And then, then Shabbos is overridden and uh, Shabbos does not apply. <coughs> Saying Hutzur. So that means that the, 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 the very definition of the mitzvah is, is conditional. Many are conditional in ways that you don't register. Like, for example, there are rules for married people. That's a conditional rule. If you are married, then these things apply to you. And if you're not married, they don't apply to you. Many, many. Uh, do you think, we're told of Abraham, 
kept all the mitzvahs voluntarily, right? Okay, all the mitzvahs is, is an exaggeration. He didn't do Kriya Satorah, Monday, Thursdays, and, and Shabbos afternoon, and then the whole parasha on Shabbos, right? Because they didn't have the text of the Torah. But well, let's take a simple one, a direct one. What about mezuzah? He lived in a tent. A tent doesn't get a mezuzah. Did he move into a house in order to put a mezuzah? I don't know. I don't know of any source that says so. Jacob built a house, the Torah tells us. Okay, built a house. I'm sure he put a mezuzah on it. What did he write for? I'm sorry? What did he write in it? I don't care. I don't what did he write in it? What did he write in it? <laughs> that's a good question. Let's figure out. The Shema would be okay, because that's all totally general. Um... Uh, Kaddish and Vahoya Lecha, that's about mitzvahs of the Chor, and when you come into the land, all that is perfectly general. I think he could have written all four, par- all four paragraphs. Yeah, that's after the Exodus. He knew he was coming back. God told him there's going to be a, there's going to be a period of, of exile and subjugation and everything else, and then he's, going, he's coming back. Yeah. Anyway, uh, well, the Egypt, it had to be Egypt, it didn't have to be Egypt. Anyway, uh, I suppose he could have written it, it, it into that. Or something else. There wouldn't have to be something else. You know. God has children also, and, and they have in them something entirely different. That's what it's written, of course, Baruch Is it also Tfum? Yeah, it's Tfum. The way it had to be Tfum at that time. Anyway. Is uh, lack of Kodana, not believing that my prayer could change the outcome on either a personal level or an abstract level? And how to counter that? So I, I think there's, there are two problems. There's the fact that you're describing, and then it's implications. And I mentioned it before, but I want to mention it again, because a lot of people have uh, peculiar ideas about this. The, um, if you don't believe that your prayer could make a difference, if you believe that the situation is set up, uh, then you have a false picture about how the Torah works. Well. It's a failure to have false pictures. That doesn't mean you're liable to punishment for all false pictures. I would imagine that almost everybody has some false pictures, but, if, but certainly a failure. There's no question about it. But it, it, it's more than just a failure because if that were true, then it would mean the Torah tells you to do things that are absurd. The act of asking is an effort to get the outcome to happen. If you're told, you know, it's like uh, the example that I give to beginners is, um, the king has a rule. He listens to requests and he takes them seriously, except the ones that arrive at the palace on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Those he burns. Okay, it takes two days for it to get there. Should I write my request on Tuesday? Probably not, because when it gets there on Thursday, it's going to be burned. He's not even going to read it. Right? Now, especially says, yeah, but it's a request to the king, so I'm writing it anyway. At that point, I think you question his sanity and you'd question is his, his sense of values, right? Here, too, for a person to say, I know he's not going, like, like Elie Wiesel wrote with irony, you know, pray, but pray softly, because if you pray too loud, God may hear it, and he'll know there are more Jews in Europe, and then he'll kill us. <laughs> he, and he understood what he was writing. He was writing a, 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 a theological paradox, right? So the Torah never tells us to do something that, that's absurd. Now, don't misunderstand me. My motto is, if my words are wrong, you've got me, I made a mistake. But you've got to get my words as I said them. I didn't say we have to know the reasons for everything that happens. I didn't say that. I can be ignorant of the reason. I can't be in a condition where I'm, I'm convinced reasonably that it's absurd. That's not true. At that point, I have to say, my being convinced is a mistake. I've made some mistake in logic or some mistake in fact and to give it up. That entertaining the idea that God uh, requires us to do things that are absurd is, uh, is a, uh, a failure. That in itself, and it's a deep failure. It's a deep failure. Well, I think, no, I want to so now you want to know the antidote? No, 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 no. I, I just want to know not to be negative. I want to enter prayer and just say, okay, I'm not going to choose God's will as absolute and unconditional. Therefore, I should be able to pray with more kavana. That's right. That might work even. That's right. I mean, Moses prayed to go into the land of Israel 515 times. 
he was used to getting an answer on the spot. He could demand an answer on the spot and get it on the spot. Uh, the boss of Rabbi Yerushalayim made a calculation. From the time that the decree was made that he's not going to the land of Israel until the day that he died, if you just count three daily prayers and take out Shabbos and holidays, you end up with 515 prayers. Whoa. It means he did it in his daily prayers. But he did it. He asked 515 times. He didn't give up. And what God says to him in the end is, don't pray anymore. And some of the commentators say, because if you ask again, I'll have to give in and it'll be worse. So it's a step one, I'm not making a joke, but step one is the admin, Hashem, don't let me treat your will as absolute and unconditional. Because then I'm setting up for failure. Yeah, but... you got to kind of raise my nukum I, 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 I agree, but for most people, that's taken for granted. It doesn't even occur to them that God's not going to hear their prayer. Okay. He's not going to take it into account. No, he's, he, the prayer taken into account. People don't, I don't think people seriously think that what had, the outcome is always, always guaranteed to be irrespective of whether I pray. I find that a very extreme uh, position to take. I don't know anybody who's explicitly or even implicitly taken that kind of position. He may say that temporarily I'm in such a bad condition, God won't, but you can't, you can't, you can't do that. How about just someone who deals with negative emotions? You know, something like that. So he's got to pray to, so he's inherently going to go. I, I, I would say to him, oh, yeah, yeah, listen, I would say to him, I would say to him, do you ever ask any human being for anything? Maybe you're too, dis, dis, too uh, besmirched, too defiled that anybody should listen to you. You don't do that, right? When you need something, you do ask, right? Okay, so could you change me a $20 bill? Can I buy your bike? You, know, you do ask people for things. God's not less than that. As one, uh, there was one person who committed what in that person's eyes was, ter- was a terrible, terrible crime. And they wouldn't be, f- my, my reverence was helping this person. And uh, she was like devastated. She brought her, they brought her before, I forget which one of the gadolim it was. Maybe it was Rav Simcha Wasserman. And he said to him, you're making one mistake. You think God is too small. He said, what? He said, you think he's not big enough to forgive this big crime. You think he's only big enough to, to, to forgive little crimes. No. God is very big. Very big. He could even forgive this big crime. She was in that despair. Like it was, it was hopeless. He restored her understanding that it was out of focus. It was out of focus. Okay. Last question. Then we have to go. Um, there is a concept that parshas ago that somebody prays for somebody else, he gets answered first, right? Yes. So I was wondering, does that work with the concept that if you pray for God to change, you know, somebody else's uh, you know, will and to, to better them, are you going to also have that? Does that affect your own? Like, uh, well, th- first of all, these rules are not, not absolute. They're, they're, they all have exceptions. That's the way our, our rules are written. Uh, and you said it well. People make a mistake. They put first in twice, which is a mistake. The rule is if you pray for somebody else, not first, if you pray for him at all, you put him at the end of the list, doesn't matter, then you will be answered first if you need the same thing. If you need the same thing. It doesn't carry over to anything that you might happen to need. So, for example, someone who doesn't have children and prays for somebody else to have children, so then that gives you, I put it this way, it gives you a merit to be answered first with respect to children. Something else could stop that merit. Nothing's absolutely unconditional. <coughs> but uh, if you ask for help in strengthening someone's resolve, you know someone's struggling with something, and you ask God to help them to strengthen his resolve, which can happen in a very simple way. God can arrange that his path will cross with somebody else's path, will inspire him. It doesn't have to be supernatural in you know, giving him a vision or something. And, and you need also... And you're asking for yourself. You're asking for yourself also. Then because you ask for him, you have a merit to be answered first. Yes, that's true.